Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, happy President's Day. Um, we're going to be continuing our discussion of biblical reflections. We're focusing on the stories of the book of Genesis and trying to find relevant lessons for ourselves in our daily to day lives. Before we start the journey of Abraham, a brief summary of the story called the Tower of Babel, the Tower of Babel. And we'll put up on the screen some readings to start our story. Abraham was 48 years old, reading number one, when the story of the tower occurred. So Abraham is alive. He's already 48 years old witnessing the disruption of the people's scheme, their dispersion, and the diversification of their language substantiated for him the belief in divine providence and completed his recognition of the creator. Now a little bit about the story, reading number two. The entire earth had one language with uniform words. Everyone spoke the same. When the people migrated from the east, they found a valley in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us mold bricks and fire them. They then had bricks to use as stone and asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top shall reach the sky. Let us make ourselves a name so that we will not be scattered all over the face of the earth. This is all from the text of the Bible itself. God descended to see the city and to see the tower that the Son of Man had built. God said, they are a single people, all having one language, and this is the first thing they do, now, nothing they plan to do will be unattainable for them. Come, let us descend and confuse their speech so that one person will not understand another speech. From that place, God scattered them all over the face of the earth, and they stopped building the city. He named it Babel, Babel because there was the place where God confused the world's language. It was from there that God dispersed humanity over all the face of the earth. So that's the text, that's as far as the story goes, as far as the text goes. We're left with so many questions as to where was the sin? What did they do wrong? What was their agenda? Why did they all live in the same place? What did it mean when the verse said, they said, let us make ourselves a name? Why were they building a tower? What did these people do that was so dangerous and so bad that God needed to get involved to stop it from happening? So what if they built a building? What's so terrible? And the verse makes it out to be a threat that God says, this is what they're going to do. Which means in this new world order post-flood, there still is free choice, but clearly God will make adjustments as he sees fit. He's going to change things around. He sees it's not going well. Now he's intervening right away. Okay, I don't like this. I'm not waiting 120 years to destroy the world. Uh-uh, not doing that again. I'm going to intervene. I'm going to use divine power by mixing up the languages of man so that they cannot continue this project. So God will intervene, God will make adjustments to allow for the goodness of man, in this case, for the mission of Abraham to begin and to be successful. So if you've ever gone to a Broadway show that has a split stage, there's a split stage going on right now in the text of the Torah. On one stage is Abraham. Now, he's 48 years old, but a lot has happened with Abraham in the first 48 years of his life. So there is a stage going on with Abraham. He is emerging. Starting from the very young age of three, he began to, to try to find the idea of a creator. 
There must be a creator to all of this. He started this from a very young age. He battled his father with this. He battled the king Nimrod with this. There's a lot of stories in the Medrash that we'll get to about Abraham pre-48 years old. So understand there's a stage going on on one side of our stage with a story of Abraham, a different man, a different man than the world has seen before, a man that's searching, a man that's willing to sacrifice for what he believes, a man that's willing to preach what he believes to others. As this is going on, there is another stage. And in this stage, humanity is unified, and they're unified on a project. They want to build a tower. Okay? God seems to be disturbed by this project, and he feels that this project is a threat to the emergence of Abraham, and therefore he's not going to allow it to go on, because Abraham has to emerge from this as the father of a new nation. Hasidus explains that the generation of the Tower of Babel knew about the flood. They were very much aware about the flood. How could they not? Anyone that survived the flood, Noah and his children, obviously spoke about it a great deal. So it was ingrained in the minds of all the survivors and the next generation and the next and the next. They spoke about the flood. So therefore, this group led by Nimrod, they want to create a world in which they can protect themselves from God. They wanted autonomy. They don't mind acknowledging God, but they also want to show, hey, God, we have some power on our own. Other commentaries explain that the tower was to wage war against God. If this God that we talk about is up there, let's build a tower. and We'll build it higher and higher and higher until we find him, and we'll wage war against him. Others say, no, they're building a tower to run away in the event that there's another flood. We'll just climb to the highest tower above where the flood can reach. Others simply explain that it was a symbol of power. It was a symbol of ingenuity, using technology, but not for the purpose of fulfilling God's will, but for their own desires. So I'd like to, to cover this episode just briefly so we can focus more on the other stage, the emergence of Abraham. So I'm going to present to you just a few thoughts to help us understand the story and see what we can glean from the story for our own lives. We already know that the leader of the world at this time is a man named Nimrod. The Torah introduced him to us as Hu Heichal Lios Gibar Tzayid. He was a warrior. He was a great hunter. He was the first king. He was the first to seek to dominate other human beings. He's going to dominate man. Some say he was the first to eat meat. He was the first to use deception to rule. And in the Madrashic stories told about Abraham's life, we find that he declared himself that he be worshipped as a god. Abraham's father, whose name was Terach, was a minister in the kingdom of Nimrod. And Abraham will do battle with Nimrod because he will not accept him as a god. And many of the early stories of Abraham's lives involves this king Nimrod. So he's leader of the world. And the world is now living in one place. Remember, they found this valley and they all settle there. No one's living outside this. So you have total unity. So here's the question. Is total unity good? We all say, let's be united, right? Every president in their State of the Union address will say the same thing. I am here to represent all of the country. I'm here to unite the country. We have a place called the United Nations, the idea of all nations coming together. Unity. Is total unity a good thing? And the answer is, it depends. <laughs> It depends who's leading. Total unity can be great if we have a great leader. You know, when the Messiah comes and he will lead the world, total unity is great. Nimrod leading an entire world is catastrophe. And the Torah will pick on one invention that had a great impact on that generation. And if you remember the text that we put up on the screen, what was that invention? Bricks. Bricks. They figured out how to build from brick. Why is that such a big invention? 
because up until now, you're living in a tent. More importantly, no longer do you have to live where you find stone. You can pick up any place you want and you can build where you desire because you have bricks. As in the case even today, the human being is wowed by tall skyscrapers, by big buildings. The World Trade Center, right? Empire State Building, Freedom Towers. When we look at these buildings and we marvel and we think, wow, how is this built? How is it possible? How did they get that high? How did they get a crane to bring the antenna to the top of the World Trade Center? And the fact that it can be built makes us as men feel invincible. Look what we can do. Which is why Osama bin Laden Yamashimai chose the World Trade Center as his target because it was the symbol of power. And it ranked up there with the Pentagon and the White House because it represented power and might. So when that generation is saying, let us make a tower that will be the center of our civilization, that will be the symbol of our united front, what they're saying is, let's make ourselves a name, a name meaning we are the name. You know, we use the term Hashem all the time to talk about God. Hashem means the name. What are they saying? If we can build this tower, if we can build a tall skyscraper because we have created brick, then we are the name. We are the creator. We are it. No longer do we have to fear a God. We are God. It will all be about us because look at what we made. And there's a power to unity. There's a power to community. There's a power to working together on a project. When everyone is unified to build one project, there's a strength to that. There's nothing they can't accomplish. The Talmud says, Ein Tzibur Meis. A community doesn't die. Ein Tzibur Ani. A community is not poor. What does that mean? If one truly looks out for another, there's very little that can stand in its way. It's a force. If we all truly cared about another, then there's not going to be poverty because we're going to share. We're going to give to one another. Sounds good, right? No more individual. It's all about community. We care about each other. The community project is what suddenly takes precedent over all else. Is that good? Again, it could be good if we're all righteous people. But what it also does is it strips away any individuality. The individual doesn't matter because it's all about community. And thus the Medrash tells us that during the construction of the tower, if a person fell from the upper floors and died, big deal. It was just part of the process. He sacrificed his life for the community project. It said no one cried. They didn't pause. There was no slowdown. But if a brick fell, if a brick fell, then they would sit and cry. Woe unto us, we lost a brick because that slowed the project. Does it sound familiar to you? If you think about the seed of communism, of Karl Marx, it's the same idea, Nimrodism, consolidate power. You're no longer an individual. You're part of a community. It's all for the party. Party before all, before self, before family. And therefore, communism felt that it's perfectly normal for you to turn your own family members in if they were in any type of way a threat to the communist party. Because you would want to turn them in. Why? Because party first. Party before family. Party before friends. Turn anyone over if it was a threat to the party. North Korea today, that's the way it operates. And the whole country is brainwashed by the same thought. 
the president will kill his brothers, kill his sisters, kill his relatives if he feels it's a threat. What did Stalin do? Anyone that's a threat to the party, they don't care the relationship that we had for 50 years. It doesn't matter. Only the party matters. The whole country becomes brainwashed by this same thought, right? It's unified. Only in North Korea, they're not trying to build a, a tower. They're trying to build a bomb, a nuclear one. No individual matters. There's no individual rights. They don't care if there's milk or if there's bread. They don't care if half the country is starving to death. That doesn't matter. We need to build our tower. Are there human rights? No. Who needs human rights? We all need to be unified to build our tower. Every evil dictator has built their tower. You get this story, why this story is an important bridge between the era of Noah and the emergence of Abraham? The Torah is already telling us what we're going to face in the history of man, that there's going to be this country that will continuously show up throughout all of our history and convince you that the individual doesn't matter, that community matters. And this is what Abraham is going to have to face. And so we have that verse that I put up on the screen, God went down to look at the city. What does that mean, God went down? Did God need to go down? It means that he looked deeply into it. Because at first glance, it's so nice. People are getting along. They are united. They're helping one another. They're building together. They're making a beautiful building. What it means, God went down, God looked deeper Let's look at the underlying motivation. Let's look at the risks. Let's look at the future potential of what's being done here, at the possibility of Nimrod remaining king of the world with no individual rights, no human rights. So God addresses the problem. And he addresses it by speaking to us, to the readers and to the students of Torah, to us here tonight. And he let us know that evil's reign on power will be short-lived. In the post-Noah era, the rainbow must be given a chance to shine. Abraham must be given an opportunity. And God will not sit back on the sidelines and just allow Nimrod to be victorious. No. I don't care for this tower idea. I don't care for this unity. It's not the unity I had in mind, and therefore I'm going to stop it. Smaller communities would allow for a greater influence by an Abraham. If the world is dispersed and now we have smaller villages, there is a chance for an Abraham to emerge and to convince members of a smaller village that there is a God and there is morals and there is ethics and there is rights of a human being. And so the divine decree is to break up this unity to divide the people into separate nations. How we're going to do that? By confusing language. If we don't allow communication to take place between people, we bring, bring about this divide. The Evan Ezra, one of the classic commentaries, say that it does not have to mean language itself, but their united feel was no longer there. They started feeling a dislike for one another which brought about a separation of neighborhoods and brought about a separation of nations and that ultimately led to a separation of languages to there being different languages. So God does to them exactly what they feared. They wanted unity, they got separation. Note, it's not punishment. They weren't evil people, they weren't sinful yet, Nimrod was. The philosophy was evil, but not the people. The people simply wanted to live together. They wanted to get along and they wanted to protect themselves from another flood. That's not evil. And therefore, there is no punishment in this story. What there is, is destruction of Nimrodism. That philosophy was destroyed, not the people. Think about it for a moment. Communism. The people that lived in the Soviet Union under communism were not evil. 
they were good people. They're still good people. They were victims of leaders that were evil. And they lived under this evil, and they were brainwashed from being a child on that communism is the way to go. That's why they feared education so much. That's why the internet was the greatest threat to communism, because it allowed their people to see what really is going on in other nations and how other nations live and what freedom is all about. And the moment they witnessed and they saw what freedom was, they didn't want it, and they turned on their leaders. The people weren't evil. They were puppets, so they were servants to the cause. That's exactly what takes place in the story of the Tower of Babel. God doesn't punish the people. He separates them. He gives them a chance to have a different leader of their own, to give them self-worth and give them human rights and give them a belief in self. So how was it destroyed? The philosophy was destroyed. Communism in the Soviet Union was destroyed. And how was it destroyed? Not with tanks, not with bombs, right? There was no superpower that came in and attacked the Soviet Union. It was simply with knowledge. Once the people got a grasp of what freedom was, they chose freedom. If you have all the people united under one dictator, if all the world was united under a Stalin, or a Khrushchev, or a Brezhnev, or a Hitler Machshamai, you understand where this goes and why God felt the need to intervene immediately, to break them up. Because if we break them up, you have a chance for democracy to break through. Will some remain communists? Certainly. Will there still be a Nimrod in the world? Oh, yes. Just because God dealt with the Tower of Bubble doesn't mean there weren't going to be evil leaders. But the evil leaders would be limited to a country, limited to a region, limited to a period of time, open to revolution, open to war for other countries to possibly invade and destroy that leader. So they could have a reign of a decade or two or three or five or ten, but that's still limited in the sense of what world history looks like. And so the Tower of Babel is destroyed so that there can be an emergence of a man named Abraham. Let's talk about Abraham. It's 2,000 years from Adam, from the creation of the world. The world has now been through a flood and the dispersion, the generation of the Tower. We're now ready for take two. What is his role? What is the main role of Abraham? Let's start. Number one, belief in one and only God, ethical monotheism. Number two, remember Noah also believed in one God. What Abraham had was the ability and the desire and the strength and the courage to spread the message. He knew he can't just keep this to himself. He has to teach it to others. Number three, Abraham is going to be the father of a new nation. A chosen people. Number four, he's called a Merkava, a chariot for God. Chariot for God means he's introducing God into the world. He's the wagon driver, and he's saying, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce God. He's representing God in this world. He's God's ambassador in this world. And what is his, his fame of his characteristic and his personality? What was his pathway to all of this? Chesed, kindness. He attracted people because of his kindness. People listened to him because he was kind. Very different than everything else the world was used to at that time, which was strength, power, might. I'm stronger than you so that you listen to me. Abraham attracted to them because he was kind. He was hospitable. Who is this individual? He's so different. I like to be near him. Let's take a look at reading number three and then reading number four, which is a, lo a long one. Reading number three, text of the Torah. God said to Abraham, go away from your land, from your birthplace, and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you great. 
you shall become a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and he who curses you, I will curse. All the families of the earth shall be blessed through you. Those are some of the most powerful verses of the Bible. It begins with the first command to Abraham, Lech Lecha, go away from your land. I'm going to send you to a new place. And there he tells him, you're going to be great. I'm going to make you into a great nation. And you will be a blessing to the world. I will bless those who bless you, and he who curses you, I will curse. Critical last verse of this particular paragraph, all families of the earth shall be blessed through you. Your job is not just going to be to be the father of a new nation, but you will bring blessing to every family on the face of the earth, what we call a light unto the nation, a blessing to all the nations of the earth. There is a wonderful book written by Thomas Cahill, a Christian who writes a book called The Gifts of the Jews, and he focuses on those, those few sentences. And I'll I put a, a few on the screen, just a few paragraphs from this wonderful book. There is no reason to think that Avram, that's his biblical name at this point, it gets changed to Avraham later. At this point, it's Abraham. Later, it becomes Abraham. So right now, Kael is calling him by his biblical first name, Avram. There is no reason to think that Avram knew where he was going or anything more than what his God had told him, that he was to go forth, the Hebrew imperative lech lecha has an insistent immediacy that English cannot duplicate. On a journey of no return to the land that I will show you, that this God would somehow make of this childless man a great nation, and that all humanity would eventually find blessing through him. So, Cahill says, those two words, Vayelech Avram and Avram went, are two of the boldest words in all literature. They signal a complete departure from everything that has gone before in the long evolution of culture and sensibility. Out of Sumer, civilized repository of the predictable, comes a man who does not know where he's going, but goes forth into the unknown wilderness under the prompting of his God. Out of Mesopotamia, home of canny self-serving merchants who use their gods to ensure prosperity and favor, comes a wealthy caravan with no material goal. He's not traveling because he wants to make business. He's traveling because he's on the mission of God. Out of ancient humanity, which from the dim beginnings of its consciousness has read its eternal verities in the stars, comes a party traveling with no known compass. He doesn't know where he's going. He's going to the land that God will show him. Yet he goes. Cahill is pointing out all the revolutionary actions that's happening in this one first mission. Out of the human race, which knows in its bones that all its striving must end in death, that's how civilized world thought at that moment, comes a leader who says he's been given an impossible promise. Out of mortal imagination comes a dream of something new, something better, something yet to happen, something in the future. If he had lived in the second millennium BC, the millennium of Abraham, and could have canvassed all the nations, of, if we had lived in the second millennium, the millennium of Abraham, and could have canvassed all the nations of the earth, what would they have said of Abraham's journey? So if we're going to interview all the nations on earth at that time to say, what do you think about this mission of Abraham, about this journey of Abraham? And Cahill here is obviously imagining what they would say in this interview. In most of Africa and Europe, where prehistoric animism was the norm and artists were still carving and painting on stone the heavenly symbols of the great wheel of life and death, they would have laughed at Avram's madness and pointed to the hev heavens where the life of the earth had been plotted for, from all eternity. His wife is barren as winter, they would say. A man cannot escape his fate. The Egyptians would have shaken their heads in disbelief. There is none born wise, they would say, repeating the advice of their most cherished wise men. Copy the forefather, teach him what has been said in the past. Then he will set a good example. The early Greeks might have told Avram the story of Prometheus, whose quest for the, for the fire of the gods ended in personal disasters. 
do not overreach, they would advise. Come to resignation. In India, he would be told <clears throat> that time is black, irrational and merciless. Do not set yourself the task of accomplishing something in time, which is only the dominion of suffering. In China, the now anonymous sages whose thoughts would eventually influence the I Ching would caution that there is no purpose in journeys or in any kind of earthly striving. The great thing is to abolish time by escaping from the law of change. The ancestors of the Maya in America would point to their circular calendars, which like those of the Chinese repeat the pattern of years in unvarying succession, and would explain that everything that has been comes around again, and that each man's fate is fixed. On every continent, in every society, Avram would have been given the same advice, that wise men as diverse as whatever his name is, in Laitsu and the city Haratha, would one day give their followers. Do not journey, but sit. Compose yourself by the rivers of life. Meditate on its ceaseless and meaningless flow, on all that is past or passing, or to come until you have absorbed the pattern and have come to peace with the great wheel and with your own death and the death of all things in this corruptible sphere. Lech Lecha, first command, go. It's real good that Abraham didn't check with anyone, but followed the instructions of God. And so the journey begins. A new start for Abraham, a new start for his family, a new beginning, new life, a new place, but also a new start for the world. Again, Hasidic teaching explains this verse is also talking to each of our own souls as it resides in the heavenly world. God tells our soul before it comes down into this world, Lech Lecha, go, leave your heavenly abode and go into the body that I will show you. And just like Abraham had a mission, we each have a mission. And the verse alludes to this in the instructions that it says to Abraham that it's also speaking to us. It uses the term artsacha, leave your birthplace, your land. Artsacha also has the word ratzon in there, your will. Moladetacha means your natural wants. Beis avicha means the society in which you were raised. Have the ability to overcome that which your will is telling you, that which your natural desires are, that which society is telling you you need to do, but instead follow the pathway that God puts before you. That's your lech lecha. That's your mission. We each have the mission of Abraham in our own story, on our own play, in our own story of life. And then as the verse says, and that's how you will become great. Powerful verse that I read earlier, those that bless you I will bless, and those that curse you I will curse. And you also have the reverse that explains the whole concept of a chosen people. All the families of the earth shall be blessed through you. The concept of a chosen people, and this concept has been attacked by our enemies for all of history. And yet it's right there, it's there in the Bible, it says it, we can't escape it, it's what it says. In 1973, the Soviet ambassador to the United Nations stood up and said, the Zionists have come forward with the theory of the chosen people. And he called it religious racism, which brought about the famous Zionism equals racism condemnation in the United Nations, which remained for decades. It was based that we called ourselves the chosen people and therefore were racists. The Protocols of Zion is all about us trying to take over the world because we call ourselves a chosen people. The, the attack on the concept of a chosen people is not limited to anti-Semites. Many of our own people have attacked the concept because it makes some Jews very uncomfortable to say that we have a unique mission. But it's really all because they don't understand what that mission is or they don't believe it. I'll go back to 1885, there was what's called the P Pittsburgh Platform. It was uh, recognizing the modern era of universal culture of heart and intellect, as it was called. Preserve Judaism, they said, as only historical identity, but become part of universal faith. And then the world will love us. 
The Pittsburgh Platform of 1885 basically said there was a Jewish convention and said, let's do away with this individual aspect of Judaism. Let's become part of the universal faith. We can still have the culture of Judaism. So we can keep some traditions just for the sake of culture, but stop the faith, stop the mitzvot. And if we do that, the world will love us because we'll be part of the world. Did it work? Did the world fall in love with us if we gave up practicing mitzvot? Did Hitler only go after observant Jews? Or did he go after every single Jew, observant or not observant? 1939, there was a rabbi, Rabbi Goldson. He wrote, if we insist, as I believe we should, upon the moral basis and universal validity of democracy, we should at the same time emphasize less and less the particularism in our Jewish heritage. You know what? Now that we live under democracy, that becomes our religion. That becomes our faith. Let's do away with this particularism of Jewish heritage. Why, why should we ignore who we are? If we're uncomfortable with it, it's only because we don't know who we are. But if we knew who we were and we we're proud of who we were, we don't need to do away with it. It doesn't mean that we don't ignore that there's a problem of anti-Semitism, but let's not be foolish to believe the problem of anti-Semitism is because people are observant of people following the mitzvot. Listen to what John Adams said. He was the second president of the United States. And he said, the Jews have done more to civilize man than any other nation. They are the most glorious nation that ever inhabited the earth. The Romans were but a babble in comparison to the Jews, and they have given religion to three quarters of the globe and have influenced the affairs of mankind more and more happily than any other people. That's what was meant, all the families of earth shall be blessed through you. Adams got it. He understood it. This was going to be a new world order after 200, 2,000 years of failure. This man, Abraham, and his descendants will be chosen to keep the world focused, to keep goodness alive, to let the rainbow shine. There, there is a clear selection taking place. Any student of the Bible can't deny it. God picks one family for the job. He picks this family because up until this point, no one else is volunteering for the job. One can say that God chose Abraham because Abraham chose God. There's a beautiful museum here in Los Angeles. It's a really nice museum. And in the entrance, it's the Skirbel Museum. And in the entrance, there is this quote from the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. And this is what it says on, on the wall of the museum. Go forth and be, be a blessing to the world. Go forth and be a blessing to the world. But the truth is, if you look into the text, that's not what it says. Now, there's a wonderful book called The Chosen People written by Rabbi Gordas, who used to be a conservative rabbi here in California. He made Aliyah to Eretz Yisrael. And he writes in his book that when he saw the first time that translation on the wall of the Skirbel Museum, he asked the director, why are the words misquoted? Why does it say, go forth and be a blessing to the world? That's not what it says. And the director said, because we didn't want to emphasize unduly the middle lines, which promise a particular land and future to Abraham's offsprings, which means we didn't want to focus on the chosen aspect. We wanted to focus just on that which sounds good to all. We wanted to instead bring out the universal aspect of the command. But that's not being totally honest, because the Torah clearly makes a selection. And any student of the Bible, every non-Jew that reads the Bible, knows it. They only want to know what does it mean, and if you're doing your job. Are you living up to it? I read in the Bible that you're the chosen people. What does that mean? And are you acting chosen? Is there something that you're doing that's indeed a light unto the nations? And they're confused if we run away from it, if we hide from it, if we say, no, 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 we're not really chosen. If we understood what chosenness meant, that we're chosen to bring blessings to them, that we're chosen to make the world a better place, it wouldn't be so offended by it. The anti-Semite that hates you will hate you whether or not you think you're chosen or not. It makes no difference that the Pittsburgh platform attempted to do away with chosenness. 
As I mentioned, Hitler, Yemach Shemai still hated you, and assimilation did not end anti-Semitism. I'm going to go through some, some readings, I'll try to do this uh, quickly. I just want to ride through some of the texts of the Bible with you, okay? What I'm trying to show you in these texts is selection. That's the key word you're looking for. Did God select one nation? That's what chosen means. He selected one and said, this is a responsibility that I am giving to you, to this nation, a particular nation that he selected. So we start with Genesis chapter 22. This is said to Abraham, verse 17, that I will surely bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand that is on the seashore and your descendants will inherit the cities of their enemies. Verse 18, and through your children shall be blessed all the nations of the world because you hearken to my voice. You will note that every time the Torah makes reference to there being a selection, a chosen, there is also a verse that says immediately that your job as a chosen people is to bring blessings to all the nations of the world. So clearly to Abraham, God selected Abraham, spoke about Abraham's children being part of this mission and bringing blessings to all the families on the face of the earth. Let's jump to the next generation. This is said to Isaac, and in these verses, a selection is taking place in which God is selecting Isaac and excluding Ishmael. Verse 2 of chapter 26, And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land that I will tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. For to you and to your seed will I give all these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. Selection just took place. And I will multiply your seed like the stars of the heavens, and I will give your seed all these lands. What does it finish with? And all the nations of the earth will bless themselves by your seed. Selection and purpose. Purpose of selection, to bring blessing to all the families of the face of the earth. Because Abraham hearkened to my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my instructions. I picked him because he was listening to me. He was following me. He was introducing me to the world. So I picked him. And now from his two children, Isaac and Ishmael, I pick you, Isaac. Let's move on to Jacob, the next generation. We're racing our way through the book of Genesis. This is said to Jacob, and this will exclude Jacob's twin brother, Asaph. And behold, the Lord was standing over him. This is a dream that he was having with the dream of the latter. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land upon which you are lying to which are, you are lying to you, I will give it unto your seed. And your seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall gain strength westward, eastward, northward, and southward. And through you shall be blessed all the families of the earth, and through your seed. You see the pattern here. It's so, it's so blatantly open. Chosen, selection, and purpose. Purpose to bring blessings to all the families of the face of the earth. And behold, I am with you, and I will guard you wherever you go. And I will restore you to this land, for I will not forsake you, until you have done what I have spoken concerning you. We're jumping now to the book of Exodus. This is said to Moses. Moses ascended to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, So shall you say to the house of Jacob and tell the sons of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and I brought you to me. And now if you obey me and keep my covenant, you shall be to me a treasure out of all peoples. For mine is the entire earth, and you shall be to me a kingdom of princes and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the children of Israel. Let's jump now to the book of Isaiah, chapter 42. This is my servant who I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall teach the true ways to the nation. You see it right there, my friends. Chosen, chapter 42, verse 1. Chosen and immediately to teach the true way to the nations. Mission, purpose of being chosen. It's not arrogant. It's not putting yourself above everyone. It's accepting a responsibility to change this world for the better for all of mankind. Isaiah chapter 49, I will make you a light of nations so that my salvation shall be until the end of the earth. Isaiah chapter 60, 
and nations shall go by your light and kings by the brilliance of your shine. And finally, I'll go back to the book of Deuteronomy and I'm going to conclude with this verse because to me, this is the most powerful few verses in the Bible that discusses a chosen people. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be his treasured people out of all peoples upon the face of the earth. Not because you are most numerous than any people that the Lord delight in you and choose you, for you are the least of all the peoples, but because of the Lord's love for you and because he keeps the oath he swore to your forefathers, the Lord took you out with a strong hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the house of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. In those few verses you have that you are a holy people, Am Kadosh. You have the words Bechar Bachar, which means chosen. You have the words Am Segula, which means treasured. And you have that you're not going to be the biggest, you're not to, to make yourself to be the most successful. That's not what this is about. It's not about you becoming the mightiest. That's not what this is about. It's about God loves you and he fulfill his promise to you and you will change the world for the better. That's the mission. That's what we have to do. That's what we've been doing for thousands of years. You are chosen. To deny this is to deny Torah and to deny Judaism. You can't escape it even if you tried. Your soul won't let you escape it, and the world won't let you escape it. And it's not racist, and it's not arrogant, and it's not offensive if you're able to explain it. It would be if the sentence simply finished saying, you are chosen, exclamation mark. But it doesn't. You're chosen to do a job. That's not arrogant. That's responsibility. That's sacrifice. That's commitment. To be an ambassador means you have a job to represent your country. And we have to remember who sent us at all times. I'll, I'll conclude with, with a simple story about George Shultz, who just passed away last week. He was Secretary of State under the Reagan administration. And the Secretary of State is the one responsible for sending ambassadors to all the countries on the face of the earth. And when he would interview a particular ambassador for a country, or perhaps it was when he was sending them off on their mission to a particular country, he would do the same thing with each one. And later they all compared notes and they realized that he did this with everyone. He had on his desk a big globe. And he would simply say to the ambassador, and now Mr. Ambassador, I want you to point to the country that you represent. And they would spin the globe to show off their geography and say, point to Mongolia where they're being sent, or to China, or whatever country it may be that they were about to, to travel to, to be the ambassador. And they would point to it on the globe, thinking Schultz wanted to know if they knew their geography. And Schultz would always say, wrong. And he would spin the globe, and he would point it to the United States of America. Point to the country that you represent at all times. Wherever you go, you represent as the ambassador, the United States of America, and you represent the president of the United States of America. We may live in America, South Africa, Australia, Israel. We are God's ambassadors at all times, at all places, wherever we go, whichever ever era it may have been. For this, we were chosen. And we claim no monopoly on heaven. We claim no monopoly on goodness. We simply claim that we have a job to do, and that's to be a light unto the nations. We'll continue with this next week. I want to wish all of you a happy week, a safe week, a healthy week. Holiday of Purim is coming up at the end of next week. It's a month of joy. We should all find reasons to celebrate. I invite you to join me Wednesday at 1230. We discuss there in great detail the subject of the chosen people. As some of you have been posting, yes, today was my Hebrew birthday. Uh, on the uh, Hebrew birthday, the Yobavitcher Rebbe would say, Mazel Gover, that there is an extra mazel that uh, gives you the ability to give blessings to others on this day. So let me take this opportunity to bless each and every single one of you, that God should indeed give you abundant blessings, blessings of protection, blessings of health, blessings of nachas, blessings of parnasa, blessings of happiness and joy each and every single day of your life. Thank you for joining me. I look forward to seeing you either Wednesday or next week.